especially for those that went with us into the break and uh, have been with us right from 6.30 when we came on air this second day of April 2024. For those that are joining us from wherever you are watching across the country, the region and indeed the world, it's the Kickstarter segment and uh, we shall be discussing the politics of central bank independence what monetary policy and central banking stands right now in light of the fact that we do not have a governor as a country all right a preamble before i introduce my guests who will be helping us understand what it means what can be and what should be when we find ourselves in this particular scenario the country's central bank has been without a governor since january 2022 and President Yorim Seveni has it given a timeline for naming a replacement that has, of course, left Michael Atingego as the acting governor as well as deputy governor at the same time. While the bank has succeeded in achieving its core functions of macroeconomic stability, its corporate governance remains in the spotlight. And today we are going to examine the toes of the economy and see where it's taking us. I have with me. Dr. Fred Mohamuza, he's on my extreme left, he's an economist and seasoned commentator. Many thanks for joining us. Good morning, happy after Easter holidays to our <laughs> viewers and panelists and hosts. You're most welcome. On his right is uh, John Walgembe, Executive Director at the Federation of Small and Medium Enterprises. Many thanks for making it. Good morning, viewers, and it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. And on my immediate left, Andrew Mohimbise, a retail investor on the stock market. Yeah, Most thank welcome. You. Thank you. Good morning, viewers. Let me begin <coughs> with Dr. Fred Mohamza, because you are an ardent watcher of the economy. I've also understood a few times that you are one of the architects of some of the economic policy rolls out that we see you advise once in a while we don't have a central bank governor we haven't collapsed another would say <laughs> uganda is pretty well what does that read for a country and for the state of affairs when it comes to running matters economy yeah thank you and good morning once again i think you need to get back to the constitution um, structurally it says um, Bank of Uganda of course shall be the central bank mm. of the country and the authority of the Bank of Uganda is vested in the board so you need to try to get back to the board the board of the central yeah, bank the, that authority is vested in the board and mm. the board is supposed to have a maximum of seven people so you're talking yeah. about the governor, the deputy governor and five other people so you're talking of a board possibly with one person less so a, a lot of things will still happen at that level because mm -hmm. you have, um, unless you want to test the competence and credibility of that board, the six members, That's right. with one of them missing. So as you say, the economy is still running. That's possibly the reason. Uh, the safety is the constitution vested that power, not in the person mm. of the governor, but rather in the board. In the board. So as long as the board is there, then you're going to have a lot of things covered. Now, that is, does not mean the governor doesn't have a role, because the governor is supposed to be the chair of, of that, that board. board. Yeah. In his absence, the deputy governor will be the, the chair of that board. But that also means when we are say, talking about a seven-member team, if one person is not there, it becomes like football. Mm -hmm. It's not that 11 guys won't win a game, <laughs> but why do they, they win it? Why do they say there should be 11? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And each one of them is given a number and a role to play on that pitch. That's right. So th that's why now you want to come back and say, what would it have been? And in the academia, we say the counterfactual. Mm. You really can't guess exactly what it should have been, but you begin back to hypothesize and theorize and think and say, what would it have been? if this team was all the seven members are there. Because now there are those views that particular person would mm. have brought, which can cross-fertilize an idea mm. uh, quite often, because e economics is neither here nor there. So the, right. the, the, the wider the experience of the people you have on the table 
both by what they read, what they went through in life, mm -hmm. and what they have been exposed to in their career to get to that level, informs their, the wealth of knowledge mm -hmm. that they are going to bring on that table. Because you may discuss and then I come and say, no, wait a minute, I've had, I have read. That extra uh, input into those discussions is possibly what you want to get back to and say, what would it have been if the 11th player was, was on that pitch? Mm. Could he have been the one to save the goal or score the goal? What would that have been? And, and that's really what you want to get back to and say, whoever said there should be seven members, like the quorum of judges, as they say, mm. there comes a case where all the nine Supreme Court judges <laughs> must give their own ruling. That's right. And then you want to say two out of seven or three out of what? So in this case, you don't have that of saying five out of seven. What would have the seventh person done? Especially when the seventh person is supposed to be the chair yeah. of, that board. of that board. So you get back into those discussions and say, are we missing anything? Are we not missing anything? And that's what we shall be seeking to understand. Yeah. What are we missing? And uh, well, if we're not missing anything, we shall also discuss whether the job or the position will be needed going and forward. And of course there will be also the internal dynamics. Mm -hmm. the, the governor is a, a chief executive officer. So they are also the management of the bank the itself. Bank. And quite often in the banking sector, I always say like pilots, there must be a pilot and a co-pilot. That's right. So in the banking sector, there is a managing director and an executive director. Mm -hmm. So similarly, the governor and the deputy governor are those chief executive persons mm. who must also manage the internal dynamics of the bank. All right, John, over the last uh, three years, mm. and of course in line with the departing of the uh, former uh, Bank of Uganda governor, Emmanuel Tomosibe Mutabide, whose own legacy still hangs large on uh, our economic policy landscape, how has it been like all this time that we have this uh, vacuum, so to speak, has there been anything significant that you can pinpoint to and say, if we had a bank, central bank governor, this is where we would be on this particular issue? Or you're like, well, looks like we don't need him. Okay, so we have to start from the mandate of the bank. Mandate, yeah. Uh, which is uh, monetary policy. Uh, the bank has a mandate on the issuance of currency. Mm. The bank has a mandate of ensuring that they control the quantity uh, of money in circulation. They control the price of money, and that's how they affect the private sector. Mm. Uh, but they also have a mandate to ensure that there's general stability in the financial system. And that's through the regulation mm. of banks, because the bank is the lender of central uh, of last resort. Yes, the financial institution is in distress, it will rush to the central bank. Therefore, the central bank has an interest in ensuring that not many of these financial institutions are running to it. Mm. Now, when uh, the late Professor Mtebri was still governor, the central bank adopted what they call the inflation targeting kind of uh, monetary uh, policy. Mm to ensure that uh, inflation is controlled. You know, we have a target of around 5% uh, uh, being the targeted inflation rate. Now, if we look at uh, the, cent the current deputy governor having come in in around 2021, we see that uh, he came in at a time of just pre-COVID. Then you had the COVID, that COVID year, and then in 2022, you had the spike. I think inflation hit around 10.7% in October of that year. It started to come down because they've kept the central bank rate quite high, which is consistent with what the previous uh, governor did. So on the side, therefore, of inflation, mm. I think they've done well with regard to making sure, because now we are around, around 3.4% or there about, uh, sometimes coming to 2.8 or there about. So I think in that, in that front, they have done well from their mandate perspective. Mm -hmm. Sometimes not so much from, sometimes the private sector feels uh, this is, they, they are so sorely obsessed with yeah. controlling inflation that they don't look at how they can spur uh, access to private sector 
credit. Now, the, the other issue we have to look at uh, is the aspect of um, central bank as an institution, as you mentioned. The governor is a CEO, and the central bank has also had some corporate governance challenges. As you know, there was this parliamentary committee of COSASE that looks into its setup, yeah. and there was a proposal to split the role of uh, governor from being the chair of the board yeah. because in essence you are supervising yourself yeah sure you are the board and then you are the chief executive so that creates it becomes a bit difficult it, it for becomes a bit difficult so the person in that position is strong it's okay mm. if they're not very strong it's not and then you've also had now a certain restructuring within since uh, the departure of the former governor and that has also created some internal turmoil. So I would say that on the corporate governance side, they've had a bit of challenges internally. Okay. But on the overall mandate of the bank, I think they've shown that they've been quite efficient. Okay. Even with the absence of a substantive government. Mm. Yeah. On the outside, anybody watching, your submission and also the submission of uh, Dr. Fred Mohomza with regard to the mandate of the bank yes. and uh, the, its workings, kind of says that we can move along, no doubt, as we patch up a few things here and there. And on the perception front, that one is catastrophic in any other country. And uh, that brings me to uh, Mr. Andrew Mohimbise, a retail investor. If, let me play out this scenario. If, for example, President Joe Biden right now decided to relieve Jerome Powell of duties and say please step aside and fail to appoint or oh, God forbid Jerome Powell departs and there is no replacement it's a scenario that is unthinkable in the United States and any other uh, country that would completely topple the bucket and uh, the ripple effects would be enormous we could feel we would feel them here in Uganda but from the perspective of uh, the markets I know in Uganda the markets are not uh, really elaborate enough for us to even tag actions of any one person, including the president or his comments, uh, to either tumbling or, uh, you know, offering some kind of uh, positive upward trajectory. But how do you look at it from the point of view of retail and uh, stock investment? Uh, thank you mm. again. I will dive directly into what you would call the political economy mm. uh, to address this. And uh, like, the, like John and uh, Fred have said, actually the, the central bank or Bank of Uganda has continued its role normally. Uh, and by and large, I attribute this to, to the influence of the IMF and World Bank because they largely control. So even the example ah. of, of the US doesn't arise. You're saying we are being run by the Yeah, IMF and, and my belief is we, we don't have a governor because probably the appointing authority and, and uh, the IMF have failed to agree who should be because they have veto power. You know, they are our lenders. So they, they, the relation to America doesn't arise mm. because we, we are not as independent as we may, we may think. Wow. So for me, it's largely a governance scandal because you can still run. The IMF will say, do this, do that, and you will do. Uh, so it is stable. Uh, Fred hinted on the part of uh, the intrigue within. He hinted on the Kosase report. Mm. And, and we know, um, as watchers, that, uh, that the previous deputy governor, uh, Louis Kasekende, and uh, a thing ago, did a job swap. Basically, they exchanged jobs. That's right, yeah. yeah. There was nothing special about whoever takes. And we know that uh, we have, uh, there is no shortage of technical, competent people to fill the position. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, classic Musevenomics uh, to, to weaken independent institutions. They have said it, uh, but not in a, a direct way. Okay. But it, it's, it's like you have a carrot and, and, and you use it you know, to manage these institutions. Mm. Maybe he wants to negotiate with IMF direct and there is no need to pass through uh, a technical person. Uh, yeah. and, and also hinting on his, uh, the, he talked of the board, the power vested in the board of BOU, but we know that the BOU board tenure had also expired. It, mm. it was just 
renewed recently. So it was operating even without the mandate. So there is that lack of political will to to know to to work on the issues of the economy. Mm -hmm. But like we all three agree that the central bank is able to dispense uh, because it has uh, bigger masters who are able to direct it and who have real power that the appointing authority cannot push back to. Okay. Yeah. And that brings me to the question I had posed to Dr. Fred Mahomza earlier. Where do we, because before you even answer that, when all of you agree that there isn't a shortage of competence uh, for running the central bank and ensuring there is macroeconomic stability, should that be reason enough for us not to need or ask and put those responsible uh, for the appointment of a governor to do exactly that. If I were, for example, to petition, and this one is perhaps a tip and a lead to one of the lawyers in the country who is uh, very... <laughs> he's, no, 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 no guessing. Yeah, of course, no guessing at all. If I were to petition, who do I petition right now? Is it the president? Is it... Uh, I don't know, advise me on that, because it could be some good piece of litigation that could set a precedent for us. Yeah, I think you have to go back to the Constitution, because that's the, the, the mother law, mm -hmm. the father law, I don't mm -hmm. know which one is which. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stay with mother. In the legal language. Because the governor is supposed to be appointed by the president, mm. and uh, then there is approval of, of parliament. So it may become a constitutional issue, you may petition or maybe go to the constitutional court to see whether um, the president has taken too long because it doesn't give him the time. Mm. It's, it's not like parliament where we had a real rush that you cannot do anything until there is a speaker. That's right. So in this case there is no lapse. But uh, that aside, even before you get into the legalese, you want to get back to the, the norms of how systems do run. What impression are you giving uh -huh. out there? Um, what because, culture are you as, creating? As he said, it's not a question of don't we have people in the country? They are here. Some countries actually appoint foreigners. Mm. Uh, at the time of the financial crisis, the, the, the mighty United Kingdom appointed a Canadian to be the yeah, governor sure. of, the, of their bank. Mm. And I was like, oh, I had always known the British to be so uh -huh. proud and so conservative. The the system. But when it required really high level and independence, mm. sometimes you don't want the local dynamics. That's right. I have an organization here where I was the chair of the board, and strictly you don't need a, a local person to avoid this business of the phone call. Why don't you come and work in my area? Do this in my area. You know, mm. Let's get a foreigner who will be independent of all our local dynamics. Mm. And indeed, somebody called him and said, Why are you not in my area? He said, Who are you? Now, this was one of the senior persons that can be. But the guy didn't know the local dynamics. Yeah. So you want to get into that kind of situation and say, what does not having a governor mean to us? You may come back to the household, as you said, household head. Mm. Quite often people, in, in, start in uh, economic analysis, we separate child-headed, woman-headed, and male-headed. Male -headed. Because the norm is male-headed. Mm -hmm. Once it gets to the other two, you want to say, what is the issue here? Because that becomes a vulnerable situation. Yeah. So there are also image issues to say if for two years you do not have a governor, how are the other countries looking at us? Not that you are not functioning, mm. but people begin to say, what's wrong? What are the issues around there? So you don't want to get into those questions uh, and putting yourself into a, a, a gray area where people begin to say, who are you? You're going to just imagine from the gray area on the, on the other side of, of countries. You don't want to give that impression. Because mm. the governor is a governor. He, he can talk with authority. He That's has right. that authority. And the mm. constitution is very clear that the governor in execution of his duties will not get advice from anybody. And some people are saying, why did the Mutavira say UCB when parliament had said? Parliament had only given advice. Advice, yeah. But the governor has that right. There is a way, a substantive way where the de facto head speaks. Mm and the public, and we are dealing here with markets. Markets are so sentimental mm. in a number of things. That's why sometimes the, the Professor Mutevide would say things, and at the end of the day, he's not abusing anybody, but mm. he's speaking to the market to give them confidence. Mm. This is my space. You remember when he said that <laughs> nobody can remove me from this position. That is he right. didn't even refer to the president who appointed him. He said, maybe God, 
<laughs> and it needs to go to remove it. At that point, you are giving people that I'm in charge here. That's right. I would say whenever a policeman raises his hand, I'm not stopping to that particular individual. Mm. It is the authority behind that police officer. Mm. So there are those kinds of things that are really crafted in. And as I said, you want to get back and say, could that be costing us? What would it have been yeah. if? And then you get into those discussions. All right. We shall need to understand what's the cost of this particular vacuum. But uh, when, if I uh, may craft in uh, John Walgembe, mm -hmm. Andrew Muhimbise spoke about Museveniomics, and that's down the, the political landscape. Mm -hmm. Is there the possibility that uh, all the available <coughs> competent candidates for central bank governor mm -hmm. do not fit within the political spectrum <laughs> that President Yuri Kaguta Museveni wants? Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm not an expert in this particular branch of economics. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite new. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> but the act says there shall be a governor who shall be a person of recognized financial banking experience and shall be appointed by the president on the advice of the cabinet. Mm. So first, <coughs> the first question when I read this would be, has cabinet has advised? Cabinet yeah, because before we tell the president, please move as cabinet advice. His pretense of a cabinet, cabinet again. <laughs> maybe cabinet has not. Uh, maybe cabinet has not advised, and mm -hmm. that's something we need to look at. Maybe the process ought to be more transparent because now we don't know who the candidates are. If Walugembe wants to apply, where do I take the application so that I get considered? I want to have a fair process where I'm dropped and said, you are not competent enough. But mm. as I look at the act, it's very vague. Because mm. it says, a person of recognized financial banking, who recognizes how many years, where should they have worked? Should they have worked in the markets like him? Mm. Should they have worked on the commercial bank side? You know, so it's very it's vague, kind of vague. Therefore, yeah. and give the, gives the president <coughs> a lot of uh, a lot of uh, leeway, and it means therefore that you get a lot of candidates, and sometimes sifting through them becomes a problem. And then you have to look at the dual issue. Uh, he talked about that. He basically gave a situation where the BOU is captured by mm. the IMF. I wouldn't take it that far. Mm. I would say that. Mm. <laughs> 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 I wouldn't take it that far, but I would say that. In this role, someone has to kind of uh, impress diverse constituencies. Mm. On one hand, you're talking about the issue, we talked about the control of the money in circulation inflation. Now, as the central bank governor, as you come to, towards elections, politicians are interested in making sure how do you create more jobs, how do we do this. Every politician, not just here, mm. but in different parts of the world, they would want the central bank to ensure that there's greater spending, there are more jobs and so on. But at the central bank the central bank perspective and the mandate, you want to control inflation. So how do you get someone, one who is firm with politicians and would say, no, I don't think this is acceptable, but on one hand also understands the political realities. Because the president, once his term has ended, mm. you don't want the central bank governor who sabotages you, who is simply interested in controlling inflation at mm. the risk of you losing an election. So I think oh, you must get someone, therefore, who is able to look at all these uh, diverse facets. And I think the president sometimes fails to get a person who ticks the boxes. One, who is competent. Mm -hmm. Two, who understands the political realities. Mm. Three, who is respected, say, by the IMF. And I think the late um, Tevi ticked those boxes. I think the deputy governor, if you look at the time he spent there, he's mm. done a fairly good job. But who am I to say? Okay. I'm not the appointing authority. Andrew so Mohembisa is more comfortable with that branch of economics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll, for example, right now, if we were to identify, of course, I'm not competent to begin to identify who the candidates should be for the central bank governor, but uh, two cents is not a problem. The president could be having a few options here and there, <coughs> but options, as John Walgembe shares, do not understand his political you know, standpoint, what he wants and what he might want to achieve at any one point in time. He does speak to the legacy of uh, Mutabide when we hear stories of the fact that he stood up to the president on some of the issues that uh, were taking sway either for the president and he said no. Do we not have that kind of person right now who can stand up to the president and be able to stay the course 
and ensure that he still retains the job. If we were to do a quick search, I don't want us to prop any person. But you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Can we navigate through this? If, for example, we had to look at who understands the president's projections in terms of political economy and how it's going to work, we could have somebody to run the ship temporarily, not so? Yeah. And on that, I'll say that, uh, you know, an acting position places the occupant in a difficult uh, uh, position. The man is acting, yeah. and he's also a deputy. Yeah. I don't know when the interchange of roles... There's nothing like acting. There's nothing like acting governor. So what is Dr. Atingego doing? He's deputy governor. He's deputy governor, yes. full stop. Full stop. So who is the and governor? Every the, action the being undertaken the now... The, the, the mantle shifts to the deputy governor. It's just like a co-pilot and a pilot, as we said. Uh -huh. You cannot be an acting pilot. That seat remains vacant, mm. and you run the plane from If the seat. pilot slumps... <laughs> yes. And, and there was a case where two pilots actually slumped last month. You cannot say, let me act as <laughs> The autopilot took over. Mm. <laughs> Good enough, they had said. So there's oh. nothing like acting in that mm. position. Okay. So, Thanks for so that very like important saying, piece of an, information. An acting, well, I'll call it an acting position. <laughs> because <laughs> the Bank of Uganda is headless. For purposes of your comfort. Yeah, I All consider right. it headless. In yeah. my branch of uh, economics, uh, an acting position places the occupant in a very difficult position. Does he want the job? Definitely he wants it. And what is best for him to do to earn the job in the current uh, political climate? <laughs> you, you basically have to kiss the ring on both knees. Yeah. You have to do what they tell you. You have to toe the line. And, uh, and, and for me, the part there is, and he hinted on it, um, what BO is in currently erodes its moral authority to, to like talk to licensees about governance issues. Because BOU has always uh, taunted the part of corporate governance. Mm. I mean, right now they they reject if you appoint a CEO. They recently rejected. Yeah, they Stanbic, rejected Stanbic uh, Bank support of the Swazi. Uh, they are heckling banks to appoint company secretaries and all. Mm. And then you ask, but what is this headless corporation doing? But then you look, why do they want it uh, that way? It's like a stick you hold over them because we know if an RDC passed on, mm. they appointed in ours, you know, governor. And to maybe to say that, yes, there is no competent person, but you remember when the Speaker of Parliament died, the assistant was someone has to come from where Olanya was from. I believe it's the same narrative that plays out, and probably we shall have an appointment <coughs> before 2026. Mm. And I am from Chigezi, so I'm not spiting the people of Chigezi, mm. but <laughs> there is loose talk that the governor has to be a Mchiga. Because the TV there was, uh, and and this is something you have to put to, to interesting the political authority. economy there. Yeah, <laughs> it's something you have to put, and and we know I think the head of commercial <laughs> banking <laughs> is mm. probably they are waiting for him to get qualified. Since it so, didn't work for the speaker, maybe it won't work for the Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, yeah. Uh, and and here you're looking at the realities in the political political economy. Because people say, you know, that was our position. What are you going to give us and say, I can hold it, and, and they can use it as chips to, to dish. But like I said, and although John uh, disputes it, the market has confidence, because by and large, IMF and World Bank run the central bank with their veto power and, and hold on policy. But the appointing authority gets the other staff, which maybe would be disturbed. And they talked of Mutebile, you know, talking of uh, how he has authority to mm. give the market confidence. Mm. So the market has confidence from the part that that you are a borrower and the lender has power over you. He won't he wouldn't allow you to burn yourself. Yeah. All right. Doctor, the fundamentals are wobbly. And uh, this can be seen across board where people's uh, ability to be to do effective demand is compromised. Many people for the last uh, five years haven't had any increment at all in terms of incomes. In fact, many have consistently suffered reductions in income and an inability to be able to purchase. And this, of course, feeds into the overall ability of uh, the economy to run. When people can't buy goods, then it means 
<laughs> there's less revenue for those that are manufacturing those goods. Yeah. Their ability to consistently manufacture becomes impaired and GDP is affected in that. So we have a cost to this, yeah. or whichever way we look at it, and it's what we want to understand. When we can quantify that and then draw a clear picture to it, then we can tell ourselves it's not a good idea that we don't have a bank, a governor for the Bank of Uganda. So what is the cost, so to speak? Yeah, I think just two things. Um, I'm not very sure the IMF is the, 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 the influencer there. It makes a contribution, like we said, every other person. Mm. Because IMF is a global financial stability institution. And, and, and so it's always interested in financial sector stability at the mm. global level, but also at the national level. I think what he reveals to us is something many of us might not be aware of, and uh, later we shall have to delve into that, tell us exactly why we are effectively uh, towing to the line of the IMF and the World Bank. I sometimes don't think it's the line of the IMF. There's no such line as uh, this is IMF. This one. Sometimes it's basic economics, and mm. we're really discussing the, 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 the doctor, not the medicine. But any doctor will give you the same medicine. <laughs> they, I like there, that. There comes time. There yeah. comes a time when the economics mm. of the IMF is the only economics you have to do. That's right. But you can tinker on the margin, and this is why we are saying: What if this eleventh player mm. was on the pitch? Because we can all say when inflation comes, pull out the hammer, hit it back. Mm. But sometimes you say, wait a minute, a little bit of it or zero of it. Now, that's where this, the debate comes in. What would another person have said? Mm. We have seen uh, different uh, uh, approaches to inflation in Turkey. Of course, they have taken the extreme end <laughs> of their case, mm. and they are punishing them, and they don't lost a, a lot of election campaigns the other day, and partly it's to do with inflation. And you want to come back at that level. When we bring down inflation, we've not brought down the prices. Now, most people would celebrate and say inflation is finally down. But maybe you gave a stronger dose and also muted the economy. And demand is not happening. Because inflation eats into the purchasing power of the people. Mm. Especially small businesses which don't have large leverage, they would suffer. But now, according to the information we got from the URA the other week, it also shows the large ones have also suffered. Because mm. the information they have been filing as their uh, returns we see drastic changes in the last two years. And this is basically because it's not your business, it's our business. If we can't have money to buy, you see your inventories rise. You've produced, you have not sold. Mm. So you can't produce more, you lay off the employees. But also you begin to suffer paying back your bank loans if you took any because you had thought you would sell and pay back the loan. So there is a ripple effect. And part of the central bank's roles is actually to look into that wider Mm. Uh, scope of the decision I'm taking, what impact is it having on the rest of the economy? Because it's also their duty. Like they, I think the Bank of England also has to monitor employment. So they will balance out the monetary policy aspects of controlling inflation with what other harm are we doing. Mm. Uh, you are supposed to be an agent of the, of the, of the, of the government and manage its debt. But we know debt has an impact. There is a direct impact, and some people don't know that the crowding out effect is not that government has taken the money. The crowding out effect works more in the interest rates. Now, part of the role of the central bank is actually to manage the rate, to allow investments, to allow growth. Mm. Now, when that role is by and large taken over by fiscal policy, because in Uganda, more or less, the rates are set by the Ministry of Finance wanting to borrow. Now, you have already muted the bank's position. Yeah. Now, that's why you want to say, would a strong governor there have stood up and say, guys, watch your space. This business of you just borrowing to finance your activities. You're disrupting the wider economy. You've also taken over my role as um, a, an entity supposed to manage interest rates with a view of developing the economy. Mm -hmm. Can you manage? You're not the only bull in the crowd. Government can finance itself, but also I need the private sector financing itself on moderate rates. Mm. Now, that conversation you wanted to come, and at the highest level, and as um, Mohibsa has said, could it be that kiss the ring? No, sometimes you want a strong person for the governor. If you come to me and you all want to say, Mr. President, I need this position, so I'll do anything that you want to do. As a president, I will not actually appoint you. Okay. One of my supervisors, the Minister of Finance, said, no, 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 you stay in the position you are in. I was on secondment mm. in the Ministry of Finance. I wasn't a staff. 
Okay. And now somebody had come up with a proposal. So that we make you a full-time staff. The PSST convention Kasami said, no way. I want him to remain on secondment. Because mm. there he knows if we disagree with me, <laughs> he has his job elsewhere. That's right. But I really want his candid opinion. If I'm naked, tell me you're naked. If I have a bad view, this is economics. Mm. Don't feel threatened because you want to protect your job. I want to hear from you what is the economics. Mm. And we had very candid conversations with Mr. Kasami, rest in peace. But they were, th these are the things that will drive and say, we can't borrow for this, mm. Mr. P.S. It's going to be a good thing for the president, but can you go and tell the president the consequences and here they are. And many times we would go and the president would give his opinion. I would call it an opinion. But some people would say, order from above. Now, as an economist and as an advisor, would say, plead for some time. So say, Mr. President, we've heard you, uh, we will get back to you. Okay. And when we get back, Mr. Seven will have a conversation. And I want to believe Mr. Seven wants such a governor mm. who can come and say, Mr. President, this is what you wanted, but these are the consequences. Do you still want to hold your view? On a lighter note, I don't think in the corridors of the central bank, <coughs> people do grapple with the order from above. <laughs> <laughs> they should be. <laughs> they should be. They All right. The uh, talking about the stability of the business cycle, in light of some of the key reforms of the economy that uh, the now departed uh, former central bank governor Mtebili had undertaken, I'm sure there were discussions that were ongoing within the business community to, for example, realign how banks, that's the central banks, the commercial banks rather, uh, do come into line, especially with, regarding to, with regard to the interest rate. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that those particular conversations and any other that had been undertaken with uh, on during the regime or the tenure, that's the better word to use, of Mutebile, um, are still on track has there been anything that has completely been taken off the rail that the business community needs to get okay. back on? Okay, so there's a view that central bankers take uh, different views with regard to their role. Mm. Some of them <coughs> look at their role very narrowly eh, in terms of monetary policy, controlling inflation, and regulating financial institutions. Mm. Others look at their role as broader mm. than that. The late governor took a view, and I've just read his speech in 2015, oh. that the central bank needs to focus narrowly on its mandate. It needs to avoid entangling itself in other developmental objectives, because he felt that on one hand, uh, the developmental objectives can sometimes contradict yeah. its core mandate of inflation yeah. uh, control. And, you don't want to and then, uh, you know, and then the other felt felt that they could also clash with other entities, say Ministry of Finance, with regard to fiscal policy, and so on. So he took a view that for us, it's concentrated on this mandate and ignore the, the rest. Yeah. Uh, I think now people are looking at central bankers differently. They feel that central bank. Uh, going back to its original mandate in the 1966 Act of saying you also have a role in growing the economy, for instance, in making sure that your policies actually spur access to credit, for instance, by the private sector. You advise government on the issue of public debt because that's its mandate. Because government cannot advise itself. Yeah. The Ministry of Finance that's borrowing mm -hmm. cannot advise itself that it's moderate uh, borrowing and, and so on. So I think that uh, the new governor that is appointed in our view needs to move away from this IMF World Bank kind of mindset mm -hmm. and have a more developmental outlook towards the role that a governor ought to have. It means that as you're controlling inflation, as doctor said, don't just focus on the numbers. Don't keep it below 5%. Mm -hmm. It is now 2%, therefore we are winning. No, look at the damage that some of those policies may be having That's on right. the business community and ultimately on the, on the economy. And if you look at the U.S., for instance, they are also required to monitor issues of jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, as a central banker, yes, you're not on the fiscal side, but what contribution do your policies make towards job creation? creation and sparring the economy. As and again, because the central bank in its uh, undertakings of research yes. on uh, what's happening within the economy yes. finds itself with so much data available to it uh, that it has to be able to share for policymakers to be able to design 
and see how the rollout of those policies should be. Yeah, so, so therefore we want a central bank, and uh, as I close on to say, we want a central bank that can ensure that we, because I, I get concerned, and I'm not very nationalistic here, but I also get concerned why we don't have strong local financial institutions. What's the problem? Why is it that most of our banks have to come from the outside? Why is it, isn't it that Ugandans can build a strong local financial yeah. institution that can have impact regionally. So that we are not just selling tomatoes in southern Sudan or wherever, but we're also taking the KCBs and stuff like that. That's right. So what role does the central bank there? The role of the central bank shouldn't just be to close. EFC has a corporate governance problem. You rush and you, you close rush it. And close. This one, Tefe Bank has a, you rush you and you close it. What can you do so that you're part of the solution yeah. and not just a problem? So I think for me those are issues that ought to be further discussed as the as the appointing authority looks at filling this position. All right. There is something you, I'm sure you will submit on his uh, perspective, but uh, I'm sure some of the people in the audience, when they see a um, person who is uh, into the thick and thin of the stock market, people want to understand the price of money over the last uh, five years. There has been fluctuations here and there uh, to the extent that our very neighbor Kenya has grappled of recent with uh, what appeared to be a free fall. Some people are saying the Kenya shilling will again go into that free fall. Uh, Ugandan shilling appeared to be stable uh, relatively in line with uh, other currencies. But you are dealing with us on, on a daily basis. What is there anything you can attribute to a policy shift as a result of uh, what you say is the influences of IMF and uh, the World Bank, so to speak, or something you can exclusively say this is as a result of the lack of somebody at the helm of the central bank that we are grappling with inability to handle these in price changes when it comes to money? Like I said, at the yeah. central bank, it's a governance scandal, but the, the <coughs> Bank of Uganda is able to move. Yeah. And what you hint on about Kenya is uh, Uganda is, is, is by and large a free market. You know, there are no price controls, and that's why we didn't have the issues of Kenya. You know, uh, yeah. we let the fuel price go up and all. It is painful in the short term, yeah. but then the market always sorts itself. Always adjusts to. In Kenya, they tried to manage the pricing and there was no supply. And it's something I was discussing with him about mm. access and cost. You're better off having something that is costly but accessible. Yeah. And not having something that is cheap but inaccessible. inaccessible. The one that leads to, that had to smuggling. Eating pie. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work because you can't afford it. It's yeah. cheap but it's not there. So yeah. what, what and the benefit? I, I would like also to hint on some of their points. I'll start with his on why there are no bigger banks. Mm. And yes, I saw, I read an article, IMF wants to tax circles. I, I am an investor in circles. And, um, and I say... So <laughs> it advised. The central. <laughs> I, I, IMF advised the same. For me, IMF and the central bank are one and the same. Anyway, they advised that they should tax circles. And to answer his questions about uh, banking institutions, you are better off growing uh, them from the ground. Because mm. right now, circles have up to 18 million members. I'm not sure of the figure that they hold, but they are doing what you'd call indigenous capitalism. And mm. when you see the big banks like uh, ABSA, mm. ABSA in full is amalgamated banks of Southern Africa. Basically, circles come together and create a bank. That's right. We shall see regional banks in Uganda in 30 to 50 years, oh, and that's where the growth <laughs> 30 to 50 years? <laughs> Yes, yeah. a whole. But that is a trajectory of economics. Mm. Yeah, I yeah, mean, has been in power for forty years. Yeah, so but surely. we have to assume that the central bank does not take a very aggressive. Can kind of up the queue? Up. Mm. Fifty years is. Uh, yeah, and uh, well, <laughs> in my life. the central bank. I'm not very popular this view taking over but you you recognize that it has actually some good governance recommendations. You know, to 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 make sure these companies run better. Mm. So I think we shall grow banking institutions from the rural areas coming up, from bottom up. We won't have the top ones. And indeed the banks that were closed, mm. I, they had governance issues. 
Yeah, it's not that people was are Was it a solution or the, the, the central bank should also take a solution based kind of approach of saying, how can we strengthen? Yeah. You know, like the yeah. sandbox approach they're taking towards oh, this. Oh, I see what you're saying. It's mm. a lack of handholding for yeah. many of these uh, small. Yeah, it's a lack of handholding. Because if the central bank was subjected to the same matrix as subject those entities, right now they would fail. Yeah, they would shut it. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. And so they have to grow from <laughs> bottom up. Mm. Then his point on uh, private sector credit. And, um, oh, back to his point, I think the central bank should not just focus on the narrowness of monetary policy, mm. you know, the credit and, and quantity of money. And, and they have some nice stuff like the SEF, the mm. Agriculture Credit Facility. Yeah. The, a year ago or so, I heard that Stanbic had $300 billion lent through that SEF. It charges 10%. Mm. And they, their strategy was to lend it to circles, which were involved in agriculture. So I think we can't narrow to just quantity of money. They should be able to do that as well, because uh, it helps. But then the other thing will go to the fiscal policy, which determines the uh, cost of credit. Because when government borrows and is desperate, um, it, it drowns out uh, private sector credit, meaning if Right now, the bonds are at 14, 16 percent. One year is at 12. So, and we saw just right after COVID, most commercial banks held up to 60 percent of their money in, in treasury bills and, and, and bonds, meaning you don't lend individuals. Mm. So, when these rates are lower, you are forced to actually lend it out because mm. the role of a bank is coal. Uh, from his studies is to create credit. That's you right. create credit uh, for the, the private sector. Uh, yeah. All right. Interesting there. We are entering the final bend of uh, this discussion. I had wanted uh, you to comment on something in the paper today. Interestingly, already you are quoted by uh, the papers here on your views on uh, taxes on fuel, you're saying, uh, for example, an increment of 100 shillings on each litre is moderate compared to the benefits government will get uh, of additional revenue. I don't think it will significantly affect fuel, though the, the reason I want us to pivot slightly away from the central bank to this particular story, government proposing 5% tax on land sales and the ramp a raft rather of taxes here, including 18% VAT on auction properties, a 10% excise duty on bottled water and other water purposely for drinking, 2,500 excise duty on each kilogram of powder for making beer, 5% levy on income from land and property transactions. You have buried yourself into this, and uh, pretty much you are quoted here by the new vision. Just give us a quick overview of, uh, I know you've already told us, we shouldn't be afraid, it's yeah. just a small one, but, well, you will also need to reassure me. <laughs> it starts at an appetite. Yeah. I, I mean, you can read on the fuel. O already you find the petrol stations, which have a difference of up to 300 shillings, all the same liter up to today. Yeah. And you'll branch here, not branch there. So 100 shillings, you're playing already within the margin that people are already accustomed to. Because I see certain petrol stations, the fuel is 5,000. I will still go to the one of 5,400. That is a difference of a whole 400 shillings. Why have I not gone to this one? So it's not going to shake anybody's decision making, but it will ramp up quite a lot of revenue, knowing that we use, uh, is it about 7.5 million liters of fuel uh, a day? In terms of revenue, now you want to get back on the other side that we don't want to get to. How is this revenue going to be used? And I think Asita gets into that conversation to say, guys, how are we spending the revenue that we get? I don't want to pay that 100 shillings and still go over pothole roads and all sorts of things. So the type of spending also needs to come into question. But we have reached that level where tax revenues are going to begin getting into areas we have not been familiar uh, with paying taxes, circles. They are earning money there. Yeah. Why should I go and tax a teacher who earns 400,000 a month and I pick per year as you earn? And the circle is earning millions in profits and that profit will be protected. Is it because it's a circle? And what about the teacher? So we get into these equality things and discussions. It's going to be a tricky discussion because some people want to hold on to their territories. That's right. To have they been paying taxes, why are you coming now? But I'm saying there are others poorer than you who have been paying taxes and canons of taxation require, let's get 
quality. All right, last question for each of us, and uh, we get with uh, Andrew Mohibisi. The budget uh, from our paper should be on the floor of Parliament. In the run-up to that discussion, the reality is the budget is already set. If you don't mind, mm. priority areas. I don't know whether you guys in the uh, money markets were consulted on any issues out there. Consultations seem to be a big problem for the, roof the of government. Goes, the appropriation uh -huh. the appropriations. Uh -huh. So he still has a window. But he has a window. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. What are your two cents on uh, the budget, and uh, what projections do you have for our economy going forward? Um, for me, on the budget. Uh, my thing is always you, you shouldn't overtax productive sectors. I mean, the water is uh, it is industry. Let the owners make some money, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, on land, I concur they should tax, but they should look at acreage, maybe above five acres, mm. uh, but not the 50 by 100 where people are buying to build. Mm. But five acres and above, you put a tax on it, so it's put to use. Mm. Yeah. But I, I largely don't agree in overtaxing because it, it kicks incent incentive out, reduces profits, and people withdraw uh, from those sectors. Uh, and same on, on circles, I say, they will be the next big banks. Yeah. Let their tax holiday continue, and they will build you the next big Let them banks. Get into the culture mm. of paying taxes before they become big banks. When On the increasing, taxes, increasing power and yeah. uh, the money base for circles, I think there must be a deliberate conversation that should be uh, kind of uh, escalated early enough to allow them to be able to hold ground in becoming uh, greater and more formidable financial institutions. I think we can tear them, as you said. Mm. Yeah. Big circles, really. Okay. Yeah. Big circles out there. All right. Issues in the budget and uh, what you see? No, that my concern is not, a budget is just a wish list to yeah. it. What happens is how you actually spend them. How you but spend I think the Ugandans money. need to focus less on the budget mm -hmm. and look at how the money is actually being spent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this issue of taxing, this 5% withholding tax on non-business assets, I don't think is wise in my view mm. allow certain sectors to grow don't be don't rush eh? don't rush to pick money left right and center it's like eating your seeds eh? mm. and so if we can <laughs> cut down on expenditure and i'm happy that the pssc says they're cutting parliamentary budget by 50 percent <laughs> yeah. he's not very popular but for us out here we feel they have not been handling the resources very well so if we can look for such money that is not being utilized well, that's being used to appreciate people for work that's unclear and so on. I think that can help us. Mm. So, but in terms of taxation, I think this 5% on land, property, and other non business assets is not wise, and we should. Uh, All right, Doctor, your last word, and also ensure that uh, you tell particularly me does this kind of trajectory lead us to the middle income status? Well, middle income, the comfort I have is the business of the World Bank to tell us. And as of now, we haven't mentioned anything uh, on that, in that space. Mm. We had with the Human Involvement Index, which is UN, that's Human Involvement <laughs> Index. Yes. It's not middle income okay. discussion. <laughs> yeah. And they, 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 we have had conversations with the UNDP, people misquoted them in this particular area. Mm. They were not speaking to the middle income mm. that the World Bank take space off. But talking about the trajectory, mm. when I see the economy, it's really slowed down. Mm. It's slowed down. The, the, the burdens on this economy cannot allow us to get in there without really tapping in things like minerals, because you need a, a big push. So it's not going to be okay. agriculture here, tourism there. This country is producing over a million people per year. That's a big drag on you. You have a huge burden of mm. young people who need social services, in the education, they need health, they need to eat, and they are all crunching on these families. This man can't move because of the dependence on him. That's so right. you need a big push until yeah. we get to that big push level. And for me, oil is one of the things I'm seeing conversation going into as infrastructure things. Yeah. Man, we need to balance out these things, and that's where views over the governor can come in as well. And all right, uh, gentlemen, uh, somebody has. Uh, amended this particular discussion in light of uh, one of the submissions that was brought forth by Andrew Mohebise, uh, the 
what appears to be the sword of Domakos hanging over Uganda in terms of the IMF and the World Bank. So let me go for a break. <laughs> when I return, we shall ask Andrew Mohebise to take us through <laughs> what is happening when it comes to the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank dictating what happens here and now. Of course, we've studied some economics in our uh, A-level and the IMF has come over as one that pretty much influences a lot that is going on. Andrew Mohibise has new information. Stay with us. Welcome back. For those that went with us into the break, we're discussing the central bank, the politics and the independence, but the discussion has allowed for a lot more on uh, the political economy, including aspects of uh, proposals by the government to tax land sales. As we continue with this discussion, of course, I have with me in the studio uh, Dr. Fred Mahomza, a seasoned economist. I also have with me John Walgembe, the executive director at uh, the uh, Federation for Small and Medium Enterprises, as well as Andrew Mohembise, a retail investor in uh, the stock market. I just have uh, a quote here on uh, the issues going on, especially with regard to the land, tax on land sales. Moses Kagua, the Director for Revenue Collection in the Ministry of Finance, is quoted as saying, the new tax measures are aimed at expanding Uganda's revenue base. Okay, just about every measure uh, pretty much looks at that. He says that from the proposed uh, taxes and other administrative measures, the government expects to generate an additional 1.2 trillion in the next financial year, which is 24, 25. But this is what interested me. According to the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, Uganda has capacity to have a tax to GDP ratio of more than 23% if various necessary measures, including stopping tax exemptions, are undertaken. He further explains that following the recommendations, and I'm going to have to underline this word, recommendations from the IMF and the World Bank, they have planned to increase the country's revenue generation by at least 0.5% every year until they reach the 23% tax revenue. This plays well into the narrative that was earlier uh, posited by uh, Andrew Mohembise, the fact that the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund allegedly ensuring that whatever goes on here is according to exactly what it wants. We all know the overarching hand of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, especially in light of what happened in 1988-89, the structural adjustment program. This is was largely World Bank and IMF stuff that have shaped the economic trajectory of uh, the country. So I cannot, uh, for example, dismiss Andrew Mohembise when he says the hand of the IMF, well, leans large on us, but perhaps there is new information away from what we all know. There is a man who is talking about recommendations, but the tone doesn't sound that they are recommendations. They are directives. I'm sure you do agree. That one plays well into your narrative, right? <laughs> Tell us about the fact that the IMF and the World Bank is perhaps doing a lot more than we see or know it to be doing. Uh, so thank you, Chris. I, I will first of all reference a Bible uh, hey. quote, <laughs> Proverbs 22. I'll read just two lines mm. from it, which says, uh, the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is the slave of the lender. And uh, <laughs> on that, I will say that I do not think <laughs> the Someone's IMF and World Bank mm. is, is, is bad. No. It is helpful. And the structure adjustment programs you've said were actually um, were, were rejected by Botswana. Mm. And Botswana did well. But you just don't reject their staff and, and automatically do well. Mm. It's it took also a lot of you. time for Botswana to be where it is. World, World Bank there is talking about the fiscal policy side of taxation, increased taxes to 23%. But what about the spending? Mm. Who controls the spending? Yeah. When you saw, I mean, you talked of the parliament budget cut by 50%. You saw the parliament exhibition by Spire. So it is, we really have to be frugal mm. to be able to do more. We, we cannot just yell World Bank. And it helps in a way, because I've told you, we have not had a governor. Practically, the appointing authority has to negotiate with the IMF and World Bank. And it's mm. why you see a semblance of good policy. If the appointing authority have had leeway, 
uh, they would do whatever they wanted, mm. which is not possible now, right now. because your borrower uh, has power. They have the your power lender. To, to, your lender, sorry, has mm. power to pull back. So they are not bad in a sense, but they ignore, the, we, we ignore the part of taking our own responsibility. And in personal finance, they say you earn in two ways. Mm. You go out and make money for government case, you go out and spend taxes. Mm -hmm. Then the second way is you actually spend less. You keep more of your money. You yeah. become more frugal. Uh, like we never question of, uh, and, and John brought it out very well, that he doesn't want to know about the budget uh, projections. He wants to know the actual expenditure. Mm -hmm. Where is the, the money going? Where is the money? How is Does it, it have spent? a good return? Mm -hmm. You know, we see roads, but there are so many potholes. So you wonder, the roads budget goes where? So you want to look at those. Let the MF play its, its side, but if you play a better role like Botswana did by being frugal and managing better, you know, fighting vices like corruption and all, you'll actually have a better return and taxes will grow naturally. Mm -hmm. But remember the base is so small and, and I support him to say you cannot tax the industry. I mean, uh, mineral water, you add 5%. These guys are running factories. If, if they are allowed to grow, they will venture into carbonated drinks if they have enough profits. Because these are capitalist enterprises. Mm. And when they make more profit, they actually grow and expand in other areas. Okay. Uh, so for me, the, 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 the conclusion is that, yes, World Bank helps us manage. I do not think it is evil. It has overbearing control, obviously. But it, it ends at the part of the fiscal policy side of taxation. The responsibility for the side of spending is ours. And that effectively says yeah. it's a necessary evil. Dr. Yeah. Mohamza, there is a review that is upcoming and uh, that involves the IMF or the World Bank alone, or it's both. It's only the core article, whatever. I IMF does regular reviews regular, yeah. uh, on countries' economies. <coughs> and that's why I was saying uh, IMF is always that doctor. You may not like them. Mm. You may not like the medicine. But really, regularly, you want to go to the doctor and uh, give you a second opinion on that's a right. number of things, even when you're right. Uh, and uh, that's partly the beauty of the IMF and the World Bank. The World Bank has just put out an economic update. They usually do two per, uh, per year. They have also looked at the public expenditure review. They raise quite fundamental issues mm. about our inability to finance the education sector. And this is the human capital we're talking about. That's yeah. so critical for a country to develop. And many countries will begin to debate, when you look back at the rights of Botswana, how did they come up to where they are today? They didn't invest in that heavy infrastructure of value addition and what? In the 70s, in the 80s, Ugandans were just going to South to, to Botswana, those countries, to educate people, to work in the education sector. Yeah. Now they have built a mass uh, human capital quality that can really propel them to where they want to be. So you don't want to compromise on your human capital for anything else, food for anything else. These are the priorities you're saying. When you look at the budget, where is the money going? Yeah. So one of the things that the IMF and World Bank gives us is that additional de conversation of involvement nature of a policy nature, which you don't get from other lenders. Because mm. remember, there was a phase where people were saying, oh, we found other alternative lenders. We can do it with the World Bank, we can do it with the IMF. But the other lenders, China and uh, many others, when they do a domestic bond, you're not picking that technical advice, because these are not just lenders. Mm. They also give you a matter. You can take it, you can leave it, mm. but it's there. You can negotiate it, but at least it gives you that insight. So we are going to have some additional reviews by the IMF, which sometimes, and actually sometimes I think the IMF is not that strong enough on us. Because yeah. when I see statements they make, I'm like, you guys, we are struggling with debt. And you see saying our debt is, is sustainable. Like everybody is waiting for World Bank. When are you saying we're in middle income? Yeah. Why are you waiting for the World Bank? Because yeah. it's an institution with the capacity and authority. So sometimes I feel 30 to 40 percent of our money going into debt repayment mm. and there are months who have actually issued bonds on the market in a month and all the money goes into refinancing. You don't even have anything left to offer services. Now such a situation you want a strong statement on how do we deal with debt. Because this government still thinks borrowed money is my money. Mm. It's not your money, it's their money. But also you have sacrificed your future degrees of freedom. Because mm -hmm. now by the time you get, you, the money is talking about you have earned, you have only earned for the lender. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And that's what the courtiers say. <laughs> the, yeah. the lender now you're getting deeper into deep, deep ends of the lender managing you. And the lender today, the one I'm worried of, is no longer the IMF and the World Bank. Is this domestic? Borrowers, because we are now refinancing. Yeah. Every year it increases. Mm -hmm. I think now we're going to refinance over nine trillion. Interest payment will cross over seven trillion. So you're talking about sixteen trillion, which is not your money in the budget mm -hmm. for you to even make a decision over. Now for me this is even a security situation. Yeah. One day Mr. Seven yeah. will want money for security and priority in budgeting principles says debt first. Then salaries and wages next. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Seven will begin to debate whether he pays his workers or he secures, secures them. The country. You don't want to put a president in such a situation. So mm -hmm. until we make debt the biggest conversation on the table. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what the IMF and World Bank are telling us. So I wouldn't want to blame the doctors. I want to say, you are sick, <laughs> and the medicine you need <laughs> is a tough <laughs> medicine. John, what's the tone yeah. like for the business okay, community? First of all, we need to tell people what these two entities are. Uh -huh. Because the IMF and the World Bank were formed in 1944 uh, during the Bretton Woods, Bretton Woods Conference. Conference yeah. And they were formed to ensure that they address the economic challenges that led to the Second World War. Mm. Now the IMF <coughs> is focused on, t I would call it a, a fair fighter, mm. and a country in economic distress, so they want to ensure that countries don't get into that position. So they tend to look at issues of balance of payments and things like that. And that's why the IMF's office here is in the central bank itself. Mm. Okay. Uh, then you have you the world bank. Paying rent and <laughs> <laughs> security, you cut no, costs. Yeah. <laughs> no, there's a not necessarily. I think okay. it's, they, they, they have to ensure that they are very hands-on in terms mm. of supervision. Yeah. All right. The world bank, on the other hand, is focused on tackling poverty. And so I don't think that they, they, that is the result, but that's what they say that mm. they are focused. So they tend to give us a lot of grants because uh, especially the international development association because yeah. that's where that that key thing now in terms of uh their role i would say that the world bank has had um, some positive but it also has some negatives look at the structure adjustment programs mm. they cause a lot of pain in african countries a lot of these businesses that we sold off that they are non-performing now we have realized that they were wrong decisions mm. so it means as we get advice from the world bank we need to take it with a pinch of salt similarly the imf that my concern with them is that sometimes they have geopolitical kind of uh -huh, things okay. that they push. Yeah. You've had this talk around Chinese debt and distress and st so on and so forth. They don't talk about their debt. Mm. The one that they what they propose but is one that to Once the Chinese thing comes, they start to, really to, 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 to... So th that's why you see, for instance, that um, they've come in to save... Uh, Zambia now, because mm. Zambia has been having some issues. They've been having discussions on restructuring their debt. Ghana is having the same issues, you see. So when you have a friendly president to the West, mm. they'll tend to move in very fast. When the president there is a bit antagonistic, they tend to raise all kinds Doesn't of issues. That's why here you've seen that Uganda is now having issues with the World Bank over this anti-homosexuality act. Because the World Bank is now trying to use its power to push its neoliberal agenda. Mm. And I think those are issues that we may need to say, okay, how do we ensure that the World Bank goes back to its core mandate of fighting mm. poverty? How do we ensure that the IMF goes back to its core mandate of ensuring that there's stability, macroeconomic stability around the world? How has uh, President Museveni performed on uh, either ensuring that uh, the overbearing approaches of the IMF are held back and then he's able to take on that which works pretty well for us or has he completely not, I shouldn't be saying that, but has he performed well in ensuring that the World Bank and the IMF is at bay and we are also able to perform on our own? Uh, by and large, I don't buy you know, mm. the scarecrow tactic of these are colonialists and all. <laughs> because if they give you money, uh, you have their money. And yeah. like he stated, the priority, the priority of the budget is, is to pay debt mm. first. Yes. Uh, you call them necessary evils, evils the yeah. termed. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think you look at the side of the fiscal policy of, of spending. Mm. I think he has managed terribly on the spending side because there's a lot of resource wastage mm. and, uh, and service delivery is, is, is not that good. And the private sector is actually what is growing. Then on the 
on the side, the fiscal policy side of taxation, uh, of sorry, I mean the monetary side of, of, of borrowing from the, the domestic markets, they have crowded out private sector mm -hmm. credits. So on the one side, private sector needs to work, but then government borrows at a high rate. But even when it borrows, it misuses the money. So it's like a double on the end. I, 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 yes, I've twisted your question, but uh, mm. for me, it's, I, I don't find um, that the IMF is a deal breaker because Botswana did not take this, but you need a semblance of, of certain things, you know, like national values, to be able to deliver on your refusal mm. of their terms. And they know it. They know it. We don't have the discipline to probably manage our own, so we shall keep borrowing. And, and they will say stuff, yes, that play into their powers, that, that proverbs quote of the borrower is, you know, uh, the slave of the lender. Because you'll have to, to do uh, the stuff that uh, they want, uh, things like increased taxes, which ironically could be good for you as well. Mm. Yeah. So we, we can't call wolf and all. Okay. All right, gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to have to close this. And uh, it's been a pleasure, no doubt. Uh, having you guys on the show this morning, you've uh, emboldened our understanding of these matters. But one thing that's for sure, the alarm bells are not ringing just because we don't have the central bank governor. So we could go 2026 and beyond without one. The reputation aspects, the public relations of that doesn't look good, I hope something can be done to realign everything. Dr. Fred Muhumza, many thanks for the submission. Andrew Muhimbise, very first time on the show, many You're thanks. Welcome. As well as John Walgembe, usual suspect, Executive Director at the Federation for Sport and Medium Enterprises. It's been a pleasure for you out there, or rather to us, the fact that you out there have been able to be with us all through as we try to understand the dynamics at play in as far as the governor for the central bank position is concerned. I'll end this morning's show with a ritual which is birthday to Tim, birthday wishes rather to Tim. You are an exceptional dad, an incredible business partner, an amazing friend, a service-oriented leader, very faithful to Allah and a special solace to a desperate soul. Wow, happiest birthday to the best year person of the year. From family and friends, a team, that is it. And I'm sure you can see the gentleman looking really, really dapper. Happy birthday. Let the stars spell your name into a great and prosperous destiny. I'm Chris Higeni. On behalf of my colleague, Priscilla Regina Naroga, and the rest of the team behind the scenes, it's been a pleasure. Have yourselves a lovely day. We'll see you tomorrow.